नमस्कार आई डॉक्टर कपिल शर्मा करेंटली वर्किंग एज एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एट इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मैनेजमेंट स्टडीज देवेला विश्वविद्यालय इंदौर इन दिस सेशन विल फोकस ऑन जनरल प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ इंश्योरेंस I will now move on to the another important principle that is principle of insurable interest. The principle of insurable interest states that the person getting insured must have an insurable interest in the object of insurance. This principle is applicable to all contracts of insurance. Insurable interest in real terms means the legal right to insure arising out of a financial relationship recognized under the law. between the insured and the subject matter of the insurance a person has an insurable interest when the physical existence of the insured object gives him some gain but its non existence will give him a loss in simple words the insured person must suffer some financial loss by the damage of the insured object for example the owner of a taxi cab has an insurable interest in the taxi cab because he is getting income from it but if he sells it he will not have an insurable interest left in that taxi cab and then he cannot buy insurance for the taxi cab which he has sold in contract of life insurance person have unlimited insurable interest in his own life life of spouse and children similarly a merchant has an insurable interest in his business moreover a creditor has an insurable interest in his debtor to the extent of debt having understood the concept of insurable interest let's now discuss how insurable interests are created first by common law insurable interest can arise out of enactment of common law for example ownership of a building car etc gives the owner the right to insure the property second is the contract in some cases a person by entering into a legal contract with someone will agree to be liable for something which he would not without entering into a contract a lease deed of an aircraft for example may make the airline company responsible for the damage of the aircraft such a contract places the airline company in a legally recognized relationship with the aircraft or the potential liability and thus creates insurable interest next by statute sometimes an act of parliament may create an insurable interest by granting someone benefit or by imposing a penalty and at times removing a liability may restrict the insurable interest a question that is very much pertinent with respect to insurable interest is that what point should the insurable interest exist up well this will depend upon the type of insurance contract like in life insurance contracts insurable interest must exist at the time of inception of insurance contract and it is not required at the time of claim however in marine insurance insurable interest must exist at the time of loss or the claim and it is not required at the time of inception but in property fire and other type of insurance contracts insurance insurable interest must exist at the time of inception as well as at the time of loss or claim the next very important principle is principle of indemnity in insurance the word indemnity is defined as financial compensation sufficient to meet the insured in the same financial position after a loss as he enjoyed immediately before the loss occurred indemnity thus prevents the insured from recovering more than the amount of loss suffered by him friends it is undesirable that an insured makes profit out of risk faced by him however if he is able to make profit then there might be more incidents of a particular risk moreover it will lead to increase in the incidents of moral hazards insurance may be for 
loss less than a complete indemnity that is actual compensation received may be less than the actual loss but the compensation cannot be more than the actual loss like insurable interest principle of indemnity also relies heavily on the financial evaluation of the loss but in case of life and disablement it is not possible to be very precise in terms of money the next important aspect is how to provide indemnity generally there are four methods but the choice is entirely of the insurer i will discuss them one by one first is cash payment in majority of cases claims are paid to the insured in cash through nft or draft etc in case of liability claim the payments are made directly in the name of the third party another method is repairs this method of indemnity is used frequently by insurers to settle claims motor insurance is the best example for this where garages are authorized to carry out the repairs of damaged vehicles in some countries insurance companies even own their garages the next method is replacement however this is not normally very popular amongst insurance companies and is mostly used in glass insurance where the insurance gets the glass replaced by firms with whom they have an arrangement because of the volume of business they get reasonable amount of discounts another very popular method particularly in western countries is reinstatement in this method the insurer undertakes to restore the building or the machinery damaged substantially to the same condition as before the loss friends there are two corollaries to the principle of indemnity and they are subrogation and contribution i'll first discuss subrogation subrogation is substitution to of one person in place of another in relation to a claim its rights remedies or securities actually it is transfer of rights and remedies of the insured to the insurer who has indemnified the insured in respect to the loss according to this principle on payment of claim to the insured the insurer steps into the shoes of the insured to claim the damages caused to the property by the third party who has inflicted the damage in other words when the insured is compensated for the losses on account of damage to his insured property then the ownership right of such property shifts to the insurer however this principle is applicable only when the damaged property has any value after the event causing the damage the insurer can benefit out of the subrogation right only to the extent of the amount he has paid to the insured or as compensation it is to be noted that subrogation does not apply to life and personal accidents as these are not contracts of indemnity in case of death of a person is caused by the negligence of another then the legal heirs of the deceased can initiate proceedings to recover from the guilty party in addition to the policy proceeds both the insured and the insurer are also not allowed to make profit they can only recover the losses incurred by them let's understand this with the help of an example mr x insures his house for rupees 10 lakhs the house is totally damaged by the negligence of his neighbor mr y the insurance company settles the claim of mr x for rupees 10 lakhs simultaneously the insurance company can file a lawsuit against mr y for rupees 12 lakhs which is the market value of the house if insurance company wins the case and collects rupees 12 lakhs from mr y then insurance company will retain only rupees 10 lakhs which it paid already to mr x plus expenses such as court fees etc and the balance amount if any will be given to mr x the insured i will now focus on ways in which subrogation can arise there are four ways in which subrogation can arise in an insurance contract and they are the first is tort under this 
when an insured has suffered a loss due to a negligent act of another, then the insurer, having indemnified the loss, is entitled to recover the amount of indemnity paid from the wrongdoer. The insured has a right in tort to recover the damages from the individuals involved. The insurer assumes these rights and takes legal actions in the name of the insured after seeking his permission. The reason for seeking permission is that the insured may have suffered another loss which was not insured arising from the same incident which he now wishes to include because the law allows only one to sue a person for once only for a single e event. The next is contract. This can arise when a person has a contractual right to compensation regardless of a fault then the insurer will assume the benefits of this right. Another way is by statute where the act permits the insurer that he can recover the damages from wrongdoer. The second corollary to the principle of indemnity is contribution. This principle does not apply to life insurance but is applicable to other types of insurance contracts. An individual may have more than one policies on the same property but in case of a loss if he claims from all the insurer then he will obviously make profit out of the losses which is not permissible and is against the principle of indemnity. To prevent such a situation principle of contribution has been evolved under common law. Contribution is defined as the right of insurer who has paid for a loss to recover a proportionate amount from other insurers who also have a liability for the same loss. The common law allows the insured to recover his full loss limited to some insured from other insurers. For contribution to arise certain conditions should be met and they are two or more policies of indemnity should exist, the policies must cover a common interest, the policies must cover common peril which is the same cause of loss, the policies must cover a common subject matter and the policies must be in operation at the time of loss. The principle ensures equitable distribution of losses between different insurers. The policy holder is not entitled to claim from each insurer more than the rateable proportion of loss to which one is liable. The formula to calculate rateable proportion is contribution is equal to sum assured with individual insurers divided by total loss upon total sum assured. Let us now understand the concept of rateable proportion with the help of an example. Mr. P gets his building insured from three different insurance companies whereby the sum assured from each company is with Mr. With company A 30,000, with company B 40,000 and with company C 30,000. Total is insured is rupees 1 lakh. Let us assume that due to fire Mr. P suffers a loss of rupees 60,000. The contribution of three insurers would be calculated as contribution of A 30,000 into 60,000 divided by 1 lakh that turns out to be 18,000. Similarly for contribution for B would be calculated and similarly contribution which is 24,000 and contribution of C would be calculated on a similar line which is 18,000. Let us say that company pay A pays entire amount to Mr. P, then company A is entitled to recover rupees 24,000 from company B and rupees 18,000 from company C. Now moving on to the last principle that is principle of proximate cause. Before discussing the principle of proximate cause, let me throw some light on three types of perils related to a claim under an insurance policy. The first is insured perils. These are the perils mentioned in the policy as being insured that like fire, lightning, storm, etc. in case of a fire policy. The second is expected perils. 
these are perils mentioned in the policy as being accepted perils or excluded perils. For example, riots, strikes, floods, etc., which may have been excluded and discount and premium availed. The third is uninsured perils. These are perils not mentioned in the policy at all or either in insured or, or expected perils. Snow, smoke, water as perils may be mentioned in this policy. An insurer is liable to pay claims arising out of losses caused by only insured perils and not by losses caused due to expected or uninsured perils. Having understood about the three types of perils, let us now look at principle of proximate cause. According to this principle, proximate cause is the initial act which sets off a natural and continuous sequence of events that produce injury. A cause that puts no effect on the happening of losses is called remote cause. This means that the proximate cause is the nearest cause but does not mean nearest in time, but it should be direct, dominant, operative and efficient. Above all, the most important point is proximate cost must be insured under the policy. Let us take an example to understand it. If stocks are burned, then the cause of loss is fire, which is an insured peril under a fire policy and claim is payable. However, if the stocks are stolen, the loss would not be payable as theft is the insured peril covered in the fire policy. For this, burglary policy need to be taken. It is therefore important to identify the cause of loss and to see if it is an insured peril or not before admitting the claim. Moreover, if the loss is brought about by only one event, then there is no problem in settlement of the liability. But many times, the loss is the result of two or more causes acting together or in tandem that is one after another. In such cases, it is necessary to choose the most important, most effective and most powerful cause which has brought about the loss. Let us understand this with the help of two different examples. First example, a person was injured by falling into a mashy ground and was unable to walk. While lying on the ground, he contracted cold which developed into pneumonia and died as a result of this. His illegal heir claimed insurance under personal accident policy. The question that arose here was whether accident is a proximate cause or pneumonia. Pneumonia is not insured peril under personal accident policy. An insurance company said that the person did not die of accident, he died of pneumonia. The court ruled that proximate cause of death was the accident and pneumonia was a remote cause and hence claim was payable under personal accident policy. Let us take another example to understand it better. A person was injured in an accident, was taken to the hospital where he contracted an infection and died as a result of this infection. The court here ruled that infection was the proximate cause of death and the accident was a remote cause and hence no claim was payable under the personal accident policy. With this, I conclude this session and hope you will find it very fruitful. Dhanyavad and Jai Hind.